Frederick Julius's Lonely Boy is a 10-episode fictional coming-of-age audio drama. Start with episode one and listen in sequence. If you love it, hit subscribe, follow Frederick Julius on Facebook, or join our email list for exclusive content, free tracks, and episode announcements. Happy listening! Sick Picnic Media presents Frederick Julius's Lonely Boy, a novella in sound and color. Written and narrated by Matt Geiler. Episode 9, Now in Stereo. My dad's dinner plate disintegrated with an atomic crack as it smashed into the wall just above and to the right of the television and inches from my head. It crossed the tiny valley of dirty carpet between there and his green leather recliner in the opposite corner so fast that I didn't see it, which made it even scarier. An explosion in crystal clear duophonic stereo out of nowhere. If we were eating dinner in front of the television, Patrick and I would sit in that valley with mom and dad behind us, each in their chairs. The recliner was a towering throne of weathered emerald skin where my dad deposited his equally towering frame every night after getting home from work. When I was littler, I imagined it had an invisible threshold that turned you into a real man when you climbed up into it. That was the very reason that I was as scared of his chair as I was attracted to it. I knew I didn't belong there. My mother occupied a wooden rocking chair with woven woolen cushions patterned into a soothing plaid the same colors as the prairie dirt in the fields that surrounded our farm. In her nightgown, she reminded me of a sad, benevolent pioneer woman from a Willa Cather novel, some nights sitting doing needlepoint, some nights just sitting. Two seats of power rising behind my brother and me, one a dais for a goblin king, and the other a gently gliding sleigh for a mother of the harvest. The abrupt gun-like snap of earthenware splintering against drywall charged my skin and sent the peculiar electricity of instant fear through my veins in a swelling alternating current. I was running out of the den even before I noticed the sick twist of my stomach bottoming out. I did look over my shoulder though to see if Patrick was following me. He was right on my heels. It may have been the last time I actually saw him cry. When you think of a bomb detonating, you think of the progressive destruction depicted in those grainy educational films from the 1950s. First the impact, then the blinding flare of the first fire, followed by the bowing of trees and streetlights before the flattening of fences and houses. But that's not how it happens at all with families. The damage is instant and complete and final, a split second for the devastation and the rest of your whole life afterward to sort it out. My instinct was to run, to preserve myself, but I'm pretty sure that by the time my legs were carrying me toward the front door, my sense of certainty was dead. After throwing the plate, my dad launched himself toward us. Maybe that was also why I ran. Just the sheer fright of his six feet five inches and 250 pounds bearing down on me from above, looking more like a shadow than a person. I didn't know if he was coming after me, Patrick, or my mom. Maybe it was all of us. All of us at once, the missiles of his anger attacking in all directions simultaneously. Patrick and I made it out the front door, the only door in our tiny country house that wasn't a sliding pane of glass that would require a jump into the darkness. So we ended up out on the deck. But once we had escaped, my dad locked the door behind us and turned back toward mom. I had never been that afraid. I have never been that afraid.
As my brother's terrified wailing seeped into the indifferent circling of the night wind, I wondered what I would witness from out there on the deck where I could see the dining room and living room through the wall-length plate glass by the door. Though I was locked out of the Colosseum, I had a clear view of the arena and a front row seat for the battle. My dad grabbed my mother by the arm with both hands and threw her across the living room into the south wall, shattering her just like that plate. She seemed to crumple and shrink as she slid down to the floor near another leather chair we had. As he continued after her, sending floor lamps and the boombox on the ledge flying in opposite directions with swings of his powerful arms, my mom made herself even smaller, shielding her head with her hands and screaming for him to stop. Her crimson face was streaming with tears, rapidly mixing with new blushes of purple and scarlet. It sounds like a stupid device from a crappy TV show, but all of it seemed to happen in flashes with single percussive echoes like giant metal chamber doors being shut from the outside, each cold-blooded crash syncing perfectly with every connection made by my dad's hands. All at once. An explosion. Fluorescent flares dividing each new unfolding horror and, at the same time, blurring the edges so that you wonder if you dreamed up parts of it. Everything coming down on you all at once. That's how my dad laid into her, and also how I felt it from outside the glass. He put the full weight of his body and the entire force of his unbounded rage and shame and frustration into his roaring bull rush the same way my screams siphoned the full measure of my lungs and felt like they would eventually shear my face away from my skull. But my screams were muted by the glass. Compared to them, the sound of my dad thrashing my mom around our minuscule living room was maximum volume high fidelity. It was hard for me to know how long the cruel hurricane blew. It could have been an hour, but was more likely a few minutes. Eventually, my parents disappeared into the upstairs to talk, my mom finally emerging to let us back into the house. The passage of time seemed like a whole life ebbing away in a full paper water wash that cleans out each color's thickness and intensity and leaves only an apparition drying in its place. My dad hadn't touched Patrick or me, but my sternum felt rattled and tight and moving in different directions, brittle and fractured from the inside out. I could barely believe what I'd just seen and what I was thinking while I was seeing it. What was I thinking? My mother is going to die tonight. My dad is going to kill my mom and I will watch it happen through this glass and there's nothing I can do to stop it. My mom is going to die because she slightly disagreed with my dad's idea about how to pay for my college. And I will watch him kill her right through this glass. And when he's finished with her, we're all alone out in the country and nobody can hear this. Nobody knows what's happening. Nobody will ever know because when he's finished, The next day was just a regular school day. Some explosions are so violent and swift that afterward everything looks exactly the same. Jill wants you to walk her home after school today. Lisa Savage was at my locker again, leaning in on the door. She was always leaning in, whether she was whispering to the other girls in a conspiratorial circle at the end of the hallway or telling Mr. Lanick she needed another day to finish her science lab sheet, her whole body was always tilted at you, into you. 
She never told you anything unimportant, and every word that skipped from her perpetually glossed lips felt like it was part of the biggest secret in the world, and she had arrived to make sure you put it together right. Her breathless and assured voice also had the slight crackle and snap of a sparkler lit just before dusk, which made every utterance seem more urgent, conspiring with her fading freckles and untamed dirty blonde curls to produce a very feral frequency. It always felt like she had just materialized out of nowhere. In my case, to deliver messages from Jill too personal to risk in casual conversation. How am I going to do that? I wondered out loud. She lives in town now, remember? Lisa laughed. Her apartment is down by the pool behind the Jack and Jill. I did remember. Almost perfectly coinciding with the first day of school, Jill's mom had moved her and her little brother into the Wayfair Apartments, a row of shabby olive green alcoves across the street from the baseball field and hidden by the grocery store. I had heard this in the same general radio static transmission from click to click that had also volunteered other details about Jill's life that I'm sure she hadn't authorized. That her parents were in the middle of an ugly divorce, that her mom had been unceremoniously kicked out of the house by her dad and told to find another place to live. There were also whispers that her mom had come into the Jack and Jill for groceries the same night they moved in with a savage black eye and her arm in a sling, but nobody I knew had actually seen this. It was almost time for the bell ahead of the last class and traffic in the halls was beginning to thin. Lisa gave a quick look over her sunburnt shoulder, which was exposed through the stretched out neck of her cotton candy Forenza sweater. Well, she smiled, can you walk her? I, I don't know, I hesitated. I mean, my mom works in her classroom until 4.30, so I don't know if... Lisa knew where I was going before I was finished. Then you'll have plenty of time to walk her home and get back to the high school before your mom leaves. This was technically true, but also assumed my mom was just fine not knowing where I was, and only cared if I was back by the time she'd be leaving, which was not true. But before I could explain this, Angie Desiree came careening around the corner and began pulling Lisa away by the arm. Come on, girl, she urged. We're going to be late. Somehow Angie paused just long enough while moving Lisa away at top speed to add on, Hey, you're walking Jill home after school, right? I don't know. Lisa surged forward back to within inches of my face and continued until her mouth was so close to my ear that her warm watermelon breath splashed into it and feathered on down my neck, probably turning all the skin a deep crimson by the feel of it. There's something she really wants to tell you, she whispered. And then she and Angie were gone, and I was left alone at my locker, breathing heavy, with one side of my face flushed and late for class again. When the final bell rang, I did something I'd never done before. Instead of grabbing my backpack from my locker and immediately heading down to my mom's room, I ran into the auditorium. I bolted through the dark gray shadows, nimbly evading the dollops of buttery light from the side windows and headed for the stage. In the right splay behind the curtains, there was a rear exit door, which emptied out into a parking lot behind the school. My original idea was to disappear quickly and quietly so I wouldn't have to walk Jill home. But by the time I was pushing the secret escape door open, I had changed my mind and was hoping she'd be on the other side. And she was. Standing by herself near the sidewalk with her arms crossed, shifting her weight from one foot to the other and looking right at me. <laughs> I thought I might run into you back here, she laughed. Looks like you escaped. Well, I didn't want to keep you waiting, I fumbled as I walked over to her. How did you know where to find me? I don't even really know. I got a bathroom pass in math and didn't go back. I got my stuff and just came out here. 
As Jill took my hand into hers and we began walking away from the school, I snuck a quick glance back toward the building. I was just making sure nobody was watching me, but then I noticed the overcast sky was pregnant with slow-moving thunderheads. The summer kind that charge everything in their path with unmistakable electricity, cutting through the humidity like a double-tracked reverb guitar and putting even tree leaves on edge, humming and sharp. I hope it rains, Jill said. Do you have a kiss for me? We stopped for a few seconds and replicated our handiwork from the other day in the theater and at the football game. A blooming flash of vermilion evaporating into gray heather, carillon and fuzz bass swelling and losing volume at once. There was a point after the florid swimming where the tips of our noses and our top lips occupied the same nanometer of space, barely touching. Jill's eyes were locked with mine. You're really good at that. I have goosebumps. I didn't know how to do it until the game. We both began laughing at that. Because we still had our arms around each other, the giggling forced our foreheads gently together and down until we had relaxed into one of those hugs where your heads are side by side on each other's shoulders. In all honesty, it felt even better than kissing, and it lasted for a few measures before I noticed Jill's back was gently shaking underneath my hands. Are you okay? I barely breathed out, not moving at all. Jill squeezed me really tight, holding for a few beats before softly releasing and pushing back out so we were just standing face to face about a foot apart. Her eyes were red and wet, and one of the tears was running into the dimple on her left cheek that formed when she smiled. My parents are getting a divorce, she exhaled. That's why my mom moved us into town. We started walking again, but we weren't holding hands. That's what I had heard, but I didn't know if it was true. My dad kicked us out. We walked the next 20 or so slow steps in silence before Jill added more details to the story. Things have been bad between my parents for a long time. I don't think they love each other anymore. Sometimes the fighting is so loud I just go in my room and shut the door. If it's really bad, I'll go on my bed and put the pillow over my head and press it in so I can't hear them. By now, we were crossing through J.C. Park, which was an enormous old green expanse in the middle of the south side of Waverly, with a rickety weathered gazebo nobody ever used, and a rusted merry-go-round nobody ever played on. The sidewalk went straight through the middle, and was always shaded by the thick canopy of leaves and branches provided by giant hackberry and cottonwood trees planted all along either side. Even if it did start to rain, it wouldn't touch us much. As we walked beneath it, everything Jill was describing about her parents fighting kept making me tear up, my throat tightening and thickening in a rising wave of sadness. She stopped us again at the edge of the park and turned me into her. My mom asked him for a divorce the night before school started and he hit her. Then he told her to get out. So she put me and James in the car and we drove into town and just slept in the back seat. The more familiar default expression of fierce determination had returned to Jill's face. There were soft splotches of pink and sugar plum around her eyes, but she wasn't crying anymore, and I knew she could see that I was about to. Thinking about her dad hitting her mom had switched my insides into overdrive, and my chest felt like a piece of tracing paper holding back a lethal tidal wave. As much as I was stretching across myself to block it, I could feel my ribs rattling against the oceanic surge and my bottom lip wouldn't stop trembling. I read your paper for English, Jill breathed. The one about being a man? 
I wanted to ask her how she got a hold of it, but a rising tide of salt and saline was narrowing my eyes, and my whole face was hot, and I couldn't say anything, and there was no way she couldn't see every violently pulsing decibel of rage and loss and hurt about to blast out of the speaker. Do your parents fight like mine do? She whispered. There are only a few times in life when someone, anyone, has the exact right key at the exact right moment that opens you all the way. There are even fewer when they know exactly what to do when it all comes out. I'm not really sure how long it was between the cloudburst and ferocious azure razor blade feedback tempest unleashed by Jill asking me that, and my realization that she had gathered my entire wild purple storm in her arms and was at once allowing it to howl and scream, while at the same time protecting the very pigment of me from being washed away by it. All I know is that I had never cried like that and I'd never had somebody know how to hold me while I did it. It was a very long fade out before I stopped convulsing and settled back into myself. Long enough that my cheeks were tight from tears that had dried in place. I felt clean and level and guilty because I thought maybe if I'd known what to ask Jill or some different way to look her in the eye, she might have been able to release the storm I knew was gathering inside her. I didn't know what to do or say or how to explain any of what had just come pouring out of me at the edge of the park. Thank you, I stammered, my breath still evening out. Jill's eyes watered, but before she'd let any of it precipitate, she grabbed my hand, positioned herself right beside me, and leaned her head down right on my left shoulder. I tilted mine down slightly so my cheek was nestled in her sunny brown cinnamon hair. We started walking again, and I heard her let a deep breath out, almost a sigh. The rest of the way to her apartment, she told me pretty much everything I'd ever wanted to know about her, like she was answering every question I'd had before I'd even thought of them. She told me how she didn't really live in Eagle, but a few miles outside of it on a farm. She spent a lot of time in town though, especially in the summer, because she got bored and the other girls did live in Eagle, and her mom would drive her in in the morning and come back and pick her up before dinner. She glowingly divulged her love of mystery books, In Excess, and The Bangles, and how tired she was of Madonna and how she had kept a diary every day since the second grade and was raising a pig for 4-H and how she wanted to be a marine biologist when she grew up. She spoke with hushed reverence about a small pond at the back of their property that would freeze over in winter and how she would sneak out and escape to ice skate on it for hours in the dead of night after her parents had stopped arguing and gone to bed. She intimated that she had a shoebox hidden in her closet in which she kept important letters and notes, vital communication from the other girls. All of this came easily and fast and wrapped in the swift blossoming vapor from the cherry carmex she deftly applied between every other sentence. She described how she met Lisa, Christy, Angie, and Joe Neal in grade school when they were all in a traveling performance jump rope group called the Heartbeats and how exciting it was to visit different towns and do shows and hear people cheer for them. She lamented at length the lack of things to do in Eagle and how she and the other girls spent day after day walking up and down the four main streets together, pooling their money to buy fun dip and sodas from the gas station by the highway, singing and practicing jumps while trying to decide whose house to hang out at and in which order so they wouldn't stay too long in one place and get in trouble. She revealed to me that all of them had had their hearts broken in the last year. Lisa's by a boy named Kirk, who made out with her every day after school and then started doing the same thing with her older sister. 
Angie's by her stepbrother from her mom's second marriage, who she now hated but had to live with every day. Christy's heartbreak was courtesy of a high school wrestler who used to drive her out into the country in his truck to watch the sunset and the stars come out over the cornfields, but who pretended like he didn't know who she was during the daytime when she tried to talk to him while he was smoking with his friends behind the co-op. Joe Neal's dad had moved out to someplace in Iowa halfway through sixth grade, and soon after she started kissing a different boy almost every day, which made her mom furious and which Joe Neal thought was hilarious. But Jill told me that when Joe Neal stayed overnight at her house, she would cry so hard she'd have to take Tylenol, and that she hated herself for missing her dad so much because all he ever did was sleep with her mom's friends, one of whom had left town with him. Then she told me about a small field on the north edge of town that belonged to an old woman named Mary Starnes who never came out of her ancient rotting wood house, even though it looked like it was going to cave in on itself from being so old. The field was virgin prairie and covered in long rustling grasses, but had a towering burr oak that Jill said Mary's pioneer ancestors had shipped from Illinois and planted for shade. She told me it bent down over the field like it was tending the grass, and that if you looked at it from the east as the sun was going down, the silhouette resembled a mother laying her baby in a crib. This summer we started going out there at dusk whenever I would stay overnight in town, she whispered. We take Lisa's mom's mason jars to catch fireflies, as many of them as we can, until the jars look like lanterns. We try to take as long as possible so it's almost dark, but not quite. When the jars are full, we all lie down under the tree, and then we take turns releasing them. We were sitting side by side now on the top front step to Jill's apartment. Every time we let them go, we have to wish one bad thing into a good thing, she continued, staring out across the street into the pulsing warmth of the afternoon. The night, whatever the rest was, vanished in a startled breath that caught in her throat. Jill's head dropped and her elbows drew into her stomach until they partially vanished, her forearms swinging between her legs, knees touching and calves angled out as she rocked back and forth in that kind of crying that comes from a place so deep that even though your mouth is as wide open as when you scream, no sound comes out. The hair on her right side was pulled back over her ear, and that's how I was able to see. The hair on her left fell down in a curtain of messy spirals that would have hidden all of this if I was sitting on her other side. I put my arm around her. I wanted to pull her out of herself the same way she had delivered me back at the park. For an instant, I got an agonizing pang to save her by leaving town, driving as far away as we could even though I had no clue about how cars really worked, making our lives up as we went along, and driving fast enough to eventually outrun the poison flood of this small, painful place. It was the same desperate ache I got to rescue my mom whenever my dad had let loose, intensified by the immediate understanding that there's nothing I can do except have the thought and wail. Jill turned into me and our foreheads met again. We were both crying, each of our faces a falling mess of sorrow, touching so that our tears and our grief tangled, mourning as we clung to each other, trading hopelessness. Finally, Jill started to breathe. The night we moved here, I wished my parents would stop fighting. I had wished that for a thousand nights. I'm sorry, I said. And then he hit her. He hit her so hard I saw her head snap back. Jill sobbed. She wasn't even yelling. She just said she wanted a divorce. He shouldn't have done that to her or to you. Jill's arms were wrapped around herself and she closed her eyes. Ready and waiting just behind my closed lips were the nightmares I'd seen in my own house, already perfectly positioned 
so that when the time came they could slide out strong and true and land lightly in her lap to let her know I understood. I just wish I could disappear, she whispered, taking my hand. Me too, was all I got out. The sudden station change of my mother's car horn jarred both of us out of our short-lived ballad. I'm not sure how my mom located me, but I didn't even have to look to know she wasn't pleased, had probably been beyond worried, and was going to ask me what I thought I was doing in that register of her voice that was sharper and somehow more blunt than her other ranges and made my skin crawl and made me feel ashamed for letting her down. I already knew she'd spend the first ten minutes of the long ride back out to the farm hammering all of this home while I looked out the window trying not to cry, and then we'd drive the rest of the way in a dismal radio silence. I raised myself up to get ready. And then Jill surprised me again. I had taken a step toward the van when she caught me by the arm, cupped my face with both of her hands, and kissed me like in the halftime shadows at the game. Like rewinding your favorite song and listening to it over and over until the tape wears out, mint green delirious over the sugary cutting hook and unapologetic. There was no question my mom could see this, and I felt scared, euphoric, whatever that place is where flying, being found out, and falling all overlap. I smiled back at Jill as I was climbing into the front seat and saw her wave as she was wiping her eyes with her other hand. My mom saw this too. Neither one of us said anything the whole ride home. I'd like to speak frankly, straightforward and cold. I haven't the patience to wait till we're old. While the blood still runs thick through our veins, I'd like to lay close and take leave of our shame. Someone once told me that Sophocles would fight. This episode of Lonely Boy is brought to you by Sick Picnic Media. To us, you're not just a listener. You're part of this journey now, too. For exclusive updates, sneak peeks, and maybe even a free track or two, hit subscribe 
Follow Frederick Julius on Facebook or sign up for our email list. Don't forget, we release new episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms every Friday. Until next time, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, it's always a good time to imagine anything. Peace and much love. Please note, Lonely Boy is a work of fiction. Names, characters, businesses, places, events, locales, and incidents are either the products of the author's imagination or used in a fictitious manner. Any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, or actual events is purely coincidental. Copyright 2023, Sick Picnic Media. All rights reserved, including the right to reproduce, distribute, or transmit in any form or by any means. For information regarding subsidiary rights, please contact Sick Picnic Media. <laughs>